Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Alyssa Sangster, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Texas. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about the issues affecting women's abilities to seek, prepare for, and attain business leadership positions. Now, obviously, there's a lot to unpack there. We only have a little under a half hour uh, to explore this, so we're only going to scratch the surface. But there are some really important issues that we can highlight and we really encourage the audience to carefully think about this, whether you're a female looking to advocate for yourself or others, whether you're a male trying to be an ally. Um, I think all of us need to do a better job of a better understanding how we can support women to give them an opportunity to have the types of leadership roles that they deserve and that they're going to be uh, excellent at and excel in. As we get started, I wanted to share Alyssa's bio with everybody. Alyssa Sangster serves as CEO of Forte and brings to the role extensive knowledge of issues affecting women's abilities to seek, prepare for, and attain business leadership positions. Drawn from her prior experience as assistant dean and director of the MBA program at the McCombs School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. There, she oversaw all activities related to the full-time McCombs MBA program, including marketing, admissions, student services, and alumni relations. Before McCombs, Alyssa was assistant director of the MBA program at Texas A&M University's May School of Business. Alyssa currently serves as treasurer and board member for the 30% Coalition. She is past chair of the Graduate Management Admission Council Annual Industry Conference and formerly served as the chair of the MBA Student Services Professionals. Alyssa sits on the board of Forte as an ex-officio member. She enjoys reading, running, cooking, and is a champion for women in business. I love everything about that. A pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Sure. I mean, you know, that, John, I mean, I have been doing this for 20 years, this uh, particular role at Forte. So I was the first employee when we got this organization started. So it's, um, you know, it's interesting to hear the background. And then, of course, just the work that we've been doing over these last 20 years to see the arc of all that's been achieved. So um, anyway, thanks for sharing that. And and um, yeah, no, excited to continue our conversation. Very good. Very good. All right. So why don't we start just by framing up really what you think are some of those core issues? I have some other questions we're going to explore, but uh, if you were to highlight, say, three plus core issues that you think are the most impactful, uh, the, the biggest roadblocks, you know, what, what creates that grass ceiling, the, the grass ceiling, the glass ceiling, um, <laughs> or other other challenges? The grass ceiling would be a little easier to push through. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, I think that what originally when we started this organization, what we saw was that women looked around and didn't really have a lot of role models of uh, leaders who they wanted to emulate and who they aspired to be like. We also heard from them that when they thought about their career and their future, there wasn't really a lot of people that were saying, oh, business careers are um, amazing and, and here's how you do that and here's the steps to um, attaining business leadership roles. Um, they, they were you know, concerned about also like the reputation of business. Like, what is it that I'm actually getting myself into? Am mm, I going to be able yeah. to do something good and meaningful with this career path? And um, those things kind of were clouding um, people's understanding of what a business career looked like. And, you know, it's easy to be a doctor or a lawyer. Those you, you have those in your head. They're on TV. You meet them in your daily life maybe attorneys, not so often, but doctors every day, you know? And so what does that mean to be in business? What does it mean to be a consultant? What does it mean to be in finance? Those were a little bit more foggy for people and for women in particular. So, 
you know, again, as you start on, on that journey, I think that was our first concern was how to demystify and how to really open doors and help women connect with business as a career, as a potential education pathway, and then also into those leadership positions. Yeah, that demystification, uh, very, very important, especially, I mean, we're well into the transition that we saw in our economy in terms of female participation in the labor force. Uh, you know, we're, we're decades into this, right? But we still see major gaps in terms of wage disparities, in terms of uh, women in leadership roles, either in C-suite or on boards of directors, et cetera. Right. So there's, there's still a lot of gaps, despite women actually making up more than 50% of the labor force uh, in many parts of the country and even other parts of the world. Um, and I think here in Utah, the last I, I saw, I think it was something like 54% of the labor force in Utah is female. Um, right. But we tend to rank at the bottom, you know, in, in number one, two or three spot for the worst in whatever category, you know, for female equity, leadership, pay, differential, all those things. Like we have more women in the workforce than men in Utah, but disproportionately, they are having worse experiences. They have worse um, opportunities, etc. So we need to do better. We can do better. Uh, and demystifying all of that and helping women understand, you know, what options are available, um, why they're appealing, um, how, how they can qualify for those opportunities, etc. is in some cases a mindset shift. In some cases, it's breaking down barriers and, and systems that are holding people back. Uh, there's a variety of, of reasons, right? But ultimately, right. Um, that demystification, I think, is really going to help start with that initial mindset shift. Yeah, I think I think that, you know, what we do at Forte a lot is try to break some of that down. And one of the things that we rally behind is this idea of pursuing an MBA. And that that degree path is something that's attractive to people with kind of a growth mindset, because that's what business is about. Business leadership is growing changing, starting your own company, helping another company change and do better. And I think um, I think that women going through that program, it, it also leaves you on the back end of the MBA with a feeling of confidence, a feeling that you can change things, that you're equipped and ready to go out and meet those challenges and, and make a difference in the world. And I think um, encouraging more women to get that MBA degree has been a part of our work over the last 20 years. And we've seen those numbers go when we first started, about 25 percent of MBA enrollments were women. Now we're at 42 percent and we're seeing many of our MBA programs. These are the top you know, MBA programs around the world. They're hitting 45 percent, 50 percent. That's mm -hmm. that's a big milestone. We like to celebrate that. But to your point, it hasn't solved all the problems up the pike, which are C-suite, women on board, senior leadership. We're seeing those improve. The numbers, yeah. for the most part, the trajectory is positive, but there's still work that companies can do to make equitable work uh, more attainable for everyone. Yeah. And, and maybe a piece of this just to highlight is the impact of the pandemic, Um you know, you probably know more details about this than I do, but I remember reading some reports, um, uh, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, 2022-ish, that we're starting to look at the impacts of the pandemic on uh, women in the labor force, women in leadership. And the general consensus seemed to be that the pandemic had pushed back the dial, you know, a generation. So all the gains we had made, we lost <laughs> quite a bit of those gains during the pandemic because women disproportionately were, you know, doing more child Stop care, there. elder care, yeah. um, you know, leaving work to be able to do those things, schooling their kids at home during the pandemic, et cetera. Disproportionately that fell on women and moms and that set them back. Right. Uh, sure. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I, I mean, I think we saw for sure there was a, a, a blip where um, that was absolutely the case. And I do think women felt the brunt of some of those responsibilities during the pandemic. Um, I think where we ended, though, uh, if we've ended, I think we're coming back out of how mm -hmm. does flexible work um, now impact that same population? And are we seeing benefits there for both men and women in terms of flexibility, remote work, 
companies radically changed their position on flexible work. I mean, radically. And it took the pandemic to do that. We've we would have wanted this 10, 15 years ago, but there was no impetus for companies to actually make change. And the uh, the workers had to have the power in that scenario for it to really play out the way it did. And it didn't hurt that the pandemic had a lot of influence as well. Um, but I think, you know, we're coming back and you're seeing things in the press where people are calling people back to office. Yeah. Um I guess before I go there, though, I will say, like, in the pandemic, I do think that depending on how you uh, break out the workforce, certain women were probably more impacted, especially if they had um, customer-focused roles or customer-facing roles, or they were in a yeah. service industry where they had to be somewhere physical. I think that group probably was more heavily impacted than um, maybe what, what we work with, uh, the, the population we work with is more the knowledge economy and the people who are able to easily remote work and still get their work done every day and maybe have someone in the background that's a little irritating, but that they were able to continue to get their work done and show yeah. up and be paid. So there's kind of, depending on how you're looking at it, I think that's a, an important factor. And as we return to work, I think um, certain industries are going to push for that. I still think you're going to see more um, uh, comfort with flexible work arrangements, no matter if it's a one-off or um, half your workforce is doing it. I think companies, um, that mindset shift at a company at the corporate level took place, and it's good for all workers, both men and women, I think. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I, I agree. I, I think for all the downsides to the pandemic, and there were many, <laughs> one of <laughs> one of the positives was it disrupted organizations in hard ways, but also really positive ways. Like it, it pushed us um, to challenge assumptions. It pushed us to embrace and lean into technologies that people had been resistant to. Um, yes. work, work design uh, evolved, you know, remote work, hybrid work, all those things evolved. So that's a really interesting uh, way of thinking about the impact of the pandemic on, on women in the workforce. Um, because on the one hand, I saw lots of reports on how the pandemic set them back a generation. On the other hand, you're right, it it, moved, it catapulted us forward in terms of the adoption of technologies and the comfort level with remote work. And so for at least for women in the knowledge economy, what I'm hearing you say is for at least for women in the knowledge economy, that um, dis despite some setbacks, there's also some catapulting forward in providing more flexible opportunities that will ultimately benefit them more moving into the future. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? It is. And I, and I think the other thing that is maybe the undercurrent is kind of like the move out to the country or the people who, mm -hmm. who left the cities for, you know, more suburban areas or more rural areas. I think you also saw a lot of reflection and contemplation about what is it I really want to achieve in life and what do I want to hang my hat on in terms of success? What's important to me? as a leader. And I think a lot of people took the pandemic as an opportunity to really explore something new and different and start their own business. They they realized, you know, this is just not what I'm really excited about doing. I want to do something I'm passionate about, something that really piques my interest, something that I can be in control of. Maybe the lack mm -hmm. of control in the pandemic um, made them say, I'm looking for something that is going to be truly my mark left behind on this world. And I'm going to get started now because I've had this push of the whole world shifting and changing. And I'm going to make something out of that. And I think women heard that siren call. And um, I don't have a data point of 20% exited the workforce and now own their own business. But yeah, yeah. I just heard anecdotally a lot of stories along that line. Yeah, which again, it's it's not for everyone, and we're not suggesting for women to be empowered. They have to like leave the corporate no. world and start their own business, That's right? Like true. every no, everyone's no. situation is different, but it is it is great that there there has been more of a, a realization and acknowledgement of the the range of opportunities uh, exactly. that that people have had, and I think that's fantastic. So whether you decided to stay at the place you had worked, uh, whether you switched jobs to a different company, whether you had decided to hang, hang your own shingle and do your own thing and start your own business, I mean, all of those are completely valid choices. And just the, the, the fact that we have a range of opportunities to really 
uh, do cool, great things. That's empowering. That's exactly. exciting. So I think I think that's wonderful. Um, something you referred to a minute ago was this idea of the return to work mandates. So mm-hmm. more and more, you know, we've seen uh, some high profile ones like Elon Musk. Um, you know, he was one of the first to start doing it, and that got a lot of press. But over time, more and more organizations have started to push those return to office mandates. Uh, And one of the biggest drawbacks that I've heard people identify based on those is how it disproportionately negatively impacts women (laughs) Um, (laughs) who, who disproportionately benefit from flexible work arrangements because of things like childcare, elder care. We know women tend to take on more home responsibilities generally in terms of cooking, cleaning, all those kind of gendered um, social norms from the past, you know, even though society has changed a lot since like the 50s and 60s and the leave it to beaver <laughs> world, True. like we, we know that disproportionately women still take on more of those tasks, right, in, in the average household. And so for all those reasons, um, remote work continues to be a really powerful mechanism to to give women opportunity to level the playing field and when there are these return to office mandates regardless of the reason regardless of the necessity you know we could debate that all day long whether they're good or bad or if they're necessary whatever but like if they're there one thing we have to acknowledge is that yes it's going to have um you know a disproportionate impact on on our female workers and that's something I think organizations and leaders need to wrestle with. So if they really think that a return to office mandate is necessary, um, be ready to articulate that. Be be ready to explain what those reasons are. I don't think workers generally are completely opposed to working in the office. You know, yeah. I, I I have a job where I can work. I, I tend to be in the office every day, but I do have tons of flexibility and I can be remote. I can't, it's more, I end up being more hybrid by choice. Um, but the reality is, you know, we, we, we're just in a different age. People tasted the sweet fruit of flexibility and they don't want to give that up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I think there's, you know, two things there. One companies should be prepared for the conversations that that return to work is going to require and your high performers. I, I'm pretty sure you still want to keep those high performers, whether or not they ask for a little bit of flexibility in their work week. If they refuse to come into the office, that's a different story. But you want to think about how how are you keeping those high performers and what level of flexibility, whether it's remote work or it's a couple of hours here and there, how are you going to structure that and how are you going to approve that? Because it's still going to be important. And I do believe the pandemic just prepared us for the generation that's coming in. You dated us by mentioning Leave it to Beaver, but there's a whole (laughs) lot of people who have no idea what that is. And they're they're walking in and saying, I have to have flexibility, whether it's for parents or childcare. It might be because they want to go you know, snowboarding next weekend. And that's important to them, right? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. So we got to think that's what I meant by it's we've hit a a tipping point and we're now back into this where now we are now into this flexible world and it's still going to be a part of our everyday conversations for a long time coming. And you also mentioned work at home and and allies we introduced at the beginning of the call of this uh, podcast, you know, like what is it that allies can do? And that's one of the things is to really think about what, how is that responsibility structured in your home? How is it that your significant other takes on these roles and what are you doing? And and really having those very open, transparent conversations because that will do more for changing the way we approach work and the pressures that are on each of us in our business life um, mm-hmm. compared to our home life. So um, yeah, encourage excellent. those conversations. Yeah. yeah, excellent point. Something else you've referred to, um, you know, with kind of the the moving out of the city, going to the rural areas, the farms, you know, that's certainly something that we saw, especially in really dense places. Like, I can't tell you how many people I talked to during the pandemic who like lived in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, who are like, nah, I'm done. And they, and they move three hours right. away. So if they have to go to the office for whatever reason, they can do it. But otherwise, they're not doing that. They're not doing the two hour commute each way. Um, you know, they, they just opt out of that. Right. Yeah. And we, yeah. we saw that happen all over, uh, all over the country. And 
sometimes it was just working remotely for the company that you're in, but a lot of times it was people choosing to pivot, choosing to shift and do something different, either a new company, starting their own business or whatever. Um, any additional thoughts on like how women can uh, pivot effectively after, you know, they've already, they're already in a career path. And maybe now they're deciding, I want to try to do something else. Maybe it's starting their own business. Maybe it's shifting industries. Maybe it's just taking on a new stretch role, something they don't really, you know, hadn't ever thought about before. And all of a sudden the opportunity presents itself. Any thoughts on how um, anyone generally, but women in particular can pivot effectively? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting scenario I guess and a, a concern that you find yourselves in is just how to how to get unstuck I guess um, from whatever place you may find yourself in and I think that uh, there's a couple of things to maybe uh, create fertile ground so that you don't find yourself stuck in a situation like that and I think there's the investing in yourself so making sure you're thinking about professional development and how can you um, be prepared for that pivot. So you're 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 getting the skills and the mindset that you need in order to make those pivots more um, more mm -hmm. easily. Um, I think. So so if I if I can yeah. chime in. So so what yeah. I'm hearing you say is rather than waiting for maybe a new opportunity to come to you and then thinking, oh, I need to like go back to school or or I need to get a new certificate or I need to you know reskill up skill in some way. Right. What I'm hearing you say is it sounds more like we should be more proactive in, you know, lifelong learners, reskilling, upskilling on a regular basis. We don't know, we can't see the future and we don't know what opportunities are going to come to us, but we can choose to proactively be seeking to upskill ourselves so that when new opportunities arise, like we're ready to embrace them. Is that kind of what right. you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just get that, get the education, get the experience that you need and make sure you're prepared for that pivot. I think that we hear women often say, you know, they were they were working hard, they were doing a good job, they were coming in under budget on all their projects, they were making all of their goals and metrics. But then when they looked up and were thinking, oh, it's time to make a move, they had done nothing to really grease the runway yeah. for what's that next opportunity. They hadn't reached out to three people on another team where they might want to work eventually. They hadn't listen to the headhunters who were calling them and saying, mm -hmm. I've got five promotions for you. And what has your company done for you? They weren't asking for that next leadership role or plum assignment in order to get ahead. So there's, there's just this, um, it's important to always keep your eyes on the horizon and be thinking about what is that next step. Don't want to not do a good job in the job you're in, yep. but you want to make sure that you are thinking about the future. And so preparing for that has a lot of different um, you know, there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle to put together to then make that step. Um, we, we of course, encourage <clears throat> education and we think, you know, an MBA is like a, a big pivot. It's a lot of the full-time MBA programs, 90% of the students that go into those programs and come out, they leave their functional area, they leave their industry, they increase their salary, and they open up a completely different pathway of business leadership opportunities by going through that. We, of course, don't think everybody wants to make that commitment and that uh, choice, but it is one of the ways that you can easily pivot if you are feeling stuck wherever you are post-undergrad. You know, three to five years you've been working, you're trying to think about that next step. So that's kind of your early career pivot opportunity. Um, and then I think we were just kind of talking about more, more senior, what it is you have to do in order to continue to go up the ladder and get those new opportunities. Yeah, yeah, I think that's excellent. And everything you just said applies equickly to men and women, right? It, we just Of course. Yes. <laughs> it, it applies to the everybody. MBA. It's for both. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely for both. It applies to everyone. Um mm -hmm. but but for sure like if 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 uh if you're a woman listening to this and you're thinking how can I get ahead, you know, the 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 mindset of my work will speak for itself. I'm just going to work hard, put my head down, work hard, do great. I will get recognized for the good work that I do and I'm going to get promoted. Sometimes yes, but a lot of times that doesn't quite work out. And and I, I'm sure that everyone can think about either examples in their own lives or examples for loved ones or friends, family, whatever, where 
that hasn't worked. Like you, you do have to proactively be the CEO of your own career and, and map out your own opportunities for growth. Cause you can't expect other people to do it for you. Um, right. Also, also we, we know that, you know, again, disproportionately leadership roles, senior leadership roles have gone to men, uh, board roles have gone to men. Um, the world is littered with subpar um men in leadership positions who, who are like promoted to their level of incompetence, the Peter principle. So like that happens all the time. We also know there's lots of research on how men are more likely to put themselves forward for a role, even if they have no experience or no skill set or background in that area. Whereas women tend to, you know, feel on, on average, you know, thinking, you know, if they see a job posting, do I meet 90 plus percent of those requirements? And I'm not even going to bother applying right. until I do. So right. those kinds of differences mean that this kind of conversation is extra important uh, for females. And it's, ex it's important for men to recognize this so that when you're in roles of authority, of power and influence, that you can use your privilege to support the, the equity um, that right. I think we all want ultimately, um, yet mm -hmm. doesn't often happen because of the systems that are in place within our organizations. Right. And it, I mean, we've talked about if women are busy with their head down, getting their work done, and they don't raise their hand as a leader, making sure that you are aware that that is somewhat of a ex expectation that women are not going to do that. So you need to make sure you go and say, it's time for you to raise your hand, or I have this assignment. Um, and just making sure that you're thinking about all of your people, not just men and women, but all of the other intersectionalities of yeah, how yeah. people approach work. And I think it the onus is on leadership and companies to create a work environment where all of the employees are going to thrive and advance. And that means you're, there's nuance there. It's not one way. And business was created 100 years ago when there was only one way because all of the men that came together to create those businesses, it was very comfortable for them to do it that way. But as everybody else entered the workforce, we've not adapted as quickly as we need to to give everyone those um, opportunities for advancement. So I think that's right on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has just been a really great conversation, Alyssa. I, I know that you're going to have to go here in just a minute. Before we wrap things up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. Great. Thanks, John. And I would say, you know, Forte, what we do at Forte is provide programming and resources that's designed to support women through that entire career journey. So a lot of the things we've talked about today, um, we have programming and content and and uh, exercises and ways to um, connect with companies and business schools and your peers and all of those things are available through the Forte website and that's fortefoundation.org. Um, and I guess my final, you know, thought is really, uh, you know, thank you for um, bringing light to this topic. I think it's important for us to have conversations, men and women, leaders in businesses. How can we? Uh, make the world, the business world, a better place and um, equitable for for men, women, and as I said, all those other intersectionalities. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Alyssa and her team at Forte can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe. They can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.